go ahead and proceed then. Let me address the reality of, of uh, some things on legalization uh, with the committee. <laughs> you want to make uh, more marijuana available in your schools? No. You want to make uh, more failing students? <laughs> you want to have more 10 and 12 year olds getting high? You want more severe hiring issues in your state? You want more auto accidents? You want more social costs? You want more people committing federal crimes? Today's marijuana is not last year's marijuana. The cultivation uh, ability uh, is, is manufacturing a, a marijuana today of the THC, THC level is incomparable to last year's or previous years uh, growing of marijuana. It is very addictive at this point in time with this type of THC that's happening. It's so good in, in Colorado, which is exactly where the information that I was quoting you to begin this conversation with came from. It's so good in Colorado that they are now exporting illegal marijuana that's being grown in Colorado um, because it is it is so good and has such a high level of THC it is it is outselling cartel marijuana so I have to ask uh, the committee uh, is this what you really want for Texas sheriffs of Texas are against uh, legalization obviously <coughs> Uh, for these reasons, and that's our position. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for your testimony, all of you. Members, do we have any questions of the panel? Representative Moody. Mr. Levin, I just want to make that you testified for House Bill 325 and House Bill 414, is that correct? Yes. And part of your testimony, and those are the only two bills, right? Yes. Okay. Part of your testimony... Uh, was regarding arrest and how we would alleviate that concern with making something class C misdemeanor and that's, that's one of the reasons you support it right? yes okay um, do either of those bills bar arrest no uh, there has been proposed there have been proposals in previous legislatures to especially after that Supreme Court ruling came down and the Laga Vista mother who wasn't wearing her seatbelt too um, in fact uh, there was a bill that Governor Perry vetoed this was like seven or eight years ago that would have restricted the discretion of officers to make arrest for many class C's so it's certainly something that could be done so let I'm gonna wade through everything you just said that was a no right no they don't bar arrest it, you may arrest under those bills that you testified for. You're right. You, you can arrest for anything but open container or speeding, although I think speeding, if it's over 100 or something, you can make an arrest. Okay. And um, one of the exceptions to the warrant requirement is search incident to arrest. Is that correct? That's correct. Does that seem like a good way to get a bigger search is to just arrest someone for a Class C misdemeanor where they have low-grade possession so they can search the rest of the car? I think that happens, absolutely. You think that would be a practical implication of those bills that you testified for? Well, it's happening now, and I'm sure it would. I mean, I'm certainly I didn't testify that those bills would uh, solve all the collateral consequences associated with marijuana. Thank you very much. Hold on, panel, please. Any other questions, members of this panel? No. Thank you. Since marijuana is, sir, since marijuana is safer than alcohol, Ms. Ms. Lee, you, you if, would, let me let me just make sure alcohol, that we call the you? next panel. No, no, no. <laughs> let me uh, let me. Uh, control it would be hard for kids to get. Right now, it's in every high school. Let me make sure that we keep uh, on track here. Uh, William Malley. Yes, sir. Please come up, sir. William Martin. Please come up, sir. Arthur Mayer. Sean McAllister.
All right, so on deck, Catherine Neal. Catherine Neal. Kim Og. Carol Olowin. Is it Renee Olowin? Oh, I'm sorry, Renee O'Neill. All right, so let me get back to our panel. Uh, Mr. Malley? Yes, sir. Please uh, pull up a microphone. And so I show you wishing to testify uh, against House Bill 2165. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, please introduce yourself, your full name, who you are here representing, and then what your position is with respect to House Bill 2165, sir, please. My name is William F. Maley. I'm here representing myself. I am retired. I live in Lorena. Uh, I had a... Uh, and, then, and then how do you wish to testify with respect to House Bill 216? Yes, I wish to testify against 2165. Okay, please proceed, sir. Yes. I had a very boring but statistically accurate staff study that I worked on pretty hard and, and Wednesday I chunked it. Wednesday I followed my I followed an ambulance carrying my grandson to the hospital. He had very nearly smoked his mind, his brain to sleep. He almost didn't make it but he did. If his brother hadn't been there he would. He is addicted to marijuana. Now, there are folks that tell you it's not addictive. Let me tell you my definition of addictive, and it comes from my grandson. He says, I cannot go to sleep without it. I cannot wake up without it. I cannot go outside and function without it. And I've lost two jobs because of it. That is a very precise definition of addiction. He, uh, he just can't stop. I'm, I'm up to a thousand dollars a month trying to get him off of it. The, the, the folks that are for it put very, uh, very kind words to it. It's recreational. It's, it's for personal use. Well, I do not want a recreational marijuana user flying the airplane that my family flies on. I do not want a recreational marijuana user pleading my case before a jury in a courthouse. I do not want a recreational marijuana user operating on my family in a hospital setting. It, that just won't work. Uh, my wife is a very talented real estate broker. She owns her own company. That sounds big, except I'm the only one who works for her. She doesn't pay me anything, but it's good, steady work. She has real estate property for rent. We looked at the Colorado law. That allows you to grow four plants in your home. There's a pellet law on the criminal and civil side which says a tenant in his home in his rent property, is that's his home. That If this law contains anything like that, it would allow someone to grow marijuana in my home. And to be kind of facetious, I don't think you folks got enough paper in this building to tell that red-headed woman what she can count or cannot do. Because I've got 58 years of experience of trying that. I would like for you to not to pass this law because I, I fear very much that it will cost me my grandson's life. He is addicted and I know it. Thank you. Long, hard job, gentlemen. Long day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Martin? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'll let you. You won't? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Martin. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, my name is William Martin. I direct and represent the Drug Policy Program at Rice University's Baker Institute, and I speak for HB 507. Perfect. All right. Go ahead, sir. I want to address the issue of, is marijuana a gateway to harder drugs? First, consider the numbers. As of 2013, nearly 44% of Americans 12 and older had tried marijuana at some time in their lives. 
but fewer than 10% had used it in the last month. As for harder drugs, about 19% had tried cocaine at some time in their lives, but only 0.6% in the last month. For heroin, the figures are 2.4 lifetime, 0.1% in the last month. But what about those who do use harder drugs? Did marijuana play a role in that? Well, quite likely most of them did use marijuana before they used either cocaine or heroin or other drugs. But it's since it's by far the most widely used and easily available illicit drug. And almost surely nearly all of them had used alcohol and or tobacco, both of which are more, far more addictive and harmful. But let's go beyond the numbers to look at a sampling of what major scientific research has shown over the decades. In 1944, after a six-year study, scientists from the New York Academy of Medicine concluded the use of marijuana does not lead to morphine or heroin or cocaine addiction. The instances are extremely rare where the habit of marijuana smoking is associated with addiction to those narcotics. The Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, which is an elite body of researchers, has published two major studies of marijuana. In both 1982 and 1999, they concluded marijuana does not appear to be a gateway drug to the extent that it is the cause or even that it is the most significant predictor of serious drug abuse. A 1995 guard, guidebook, Marijuana Facts for Teens, published by the Department of Health and Human Services, states unequivocally that most marijuana users do not go on to use other drugs. A 2006 article in the American Journal of Psychiatry said, the likelihood that someone will transition to the light use of illegal drugs is determined not by the preceding use of a particular drug, but instead by the user's individual tendencies and environmental circumstances. The emphasis on the drugs themselves, rather than on other more important factors that shape a person's behavior, has been detrimental to drug policy and to prevention programs. In other words, addiction seems to rest more in the nature of the soil than in the characteristics of the seed. The individual user, rather than the drug, is the core of the problem. To sum up, the overwhelming majority of people who ever use marijuana do not go on to use harder drugs. Of those who do, extensive research has concluded that the causal factors reside not in the drug itself, but in the complex of genetic, social, and psychological factors that led them to seek relief in mind-altering circumstances in the first place. Prohibition cannot address those problems, but it does serve as a gateway into the criminal justice system, which will make those problems immeasurably worse. Thank you. Thank you for saying a lot within the a lot at time. I appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, Arthur Mayer? Yes, sir. All right. Introduce yourself, sir, who you're here representing, and then what your positions are. With My name is Arthur Mayer, and I'm here in, uh, speaking in favor of HB 507-2165. I'm a veteran and a Republican voter in Johnson County. I thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, for holding this hearing on HB 507. Mr. As Mayer, and then, so you're just technically speaking, you're here representing yourself? Uh, yes, sir. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Texas veteran and a Republican voter in Johnson County. I, I'm Sure. Myself. All right. Go ahead, sir. Uh, as a Republican, I'm an, I'm an advocate for limited government and uh, proper and responsible use of law enforcement resources. I would like to bring your attention to the clearance rates for index crimes that are listed in the uh, safety. Crime offenses are selected for their seriousness, their frequency of occurrence, and likelihood of being reported. There are, there are seven index crimes. Uh, four of them are violent and three are nonviolent. Uh, the violent crimes are murder, forcible rape, a robbery, and aggravated assault. Uh, the non-violent uh, crimes are robbery, uh, larceny, and uh, vehicle theft. In all of these uh, offenses, there's a victim that has suffered physical or material loss as a result of the crime. These are the most serious and it's why they're used to paint a statistical picture of crime and its impact on society in Texas. Marijuana is not included in this index because it does not fall into that seriousness of, of uh, most serious and um, uh, material loss. But it is reported in that report on the um, Select Non-Index Crimes Report. In 2013, the clearance rate for all seven index crimes was only 20%. 
The highest clearance rate was for murder, which is uh, 74 percent. The clearance for rape in 2013 was 41 percent. Um, in that same year, over 70,000 uh, Texans were arrested for marijuana. Uh, in 2012, that number was 72,000. And if you're thinking that most of these arrests have been for trafficking or dealing, you'd be wrong. They were just for simple possession. Uh, to put this in perspective, consider this. Uh, one murder occurs every seven hours, and 26 of those murders remain unsolved. One rape every hour, 59% unresolved. Uh, one property crime every 36 seconds with 53% unresolved or uncleared. Uh, with an estimated loss of $2 billion, which only 12% of those are covered on the crimes that are solved. Uh, to put that in contrast, uh, uh, one marijuana possession uh, re uh, results in an arrest every seven minutes. And that, that one, uh, those 70,000 arrests um, add up to 351,000 police man hours that are lost that could be used to solving the index crimes that are the most serious in the state. Um, this is, of course, in addition to the cost of the trial and imprisonment, plus opportunity costs when it comes to our prosecutors being overburdened and less equipped to prosecute index crimes. I support HB 507 and Representative Moody's effort to better utilize our criminal justice resources. Uh, the lost police man hours uh, could be put to more productive use, such as increasing the clearance rates for index crimes. This bill is a win-win for our citizens and therefore the state of Texas, and I thank you for your time and consideration on that. I would like to make a, a small statement, if I could, on 2165. Uh, at one time, um, people in this world thought the earth was flat. Somebody had to have the courage to stand up and say, the world is round. Well, I think uh, Representative Simpson has that courage and moral clarity to stand up and say that marijuana is not intrinsically evil and there's no moral failure for its consumption. Um, I'm a Christian and I'm, I'm proud to call Representative Simpson my Christian brother and I don't think he's uh, in any way uh, misapplied scripture. Thank you. Mr. McAllister. Hello, my name is Sean McAllister. I'm here representing both myself and the Dallas-Fort Worth chapter of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, and I am testifying in favor of HB 2165. Great. Please proceed, sir. Uh, I know there's been a lot of testimony today, so I'm going to keep this very brief. I would like to propose a bit of a thought exercise Imagine for a moment that marijuana was never made legal to begin with. We have this plant that people are using safely. They're using it for medicine. They're using it for energy. They're using it for a number of different reasons. Now I would like you to imagine the reason that we can use to justify taking this plant away from people for making it illegal. And whatever that reason that may have popped into your head might be, I wonder if that reason is based on misinformation excuse me, misinformation, or is that reason based on facts and science and data? The things that matter to Texans, the things that should matter when it comes to setting policy. And I would like to say that if, if marijuana was never made illegal to begin with, we wouldn't be having these conversations, we wouldn't be arresting so many people, we wouldn't be trying to uh, change the fabric of what makes this country great by, by questioning things and questioning uh, the, the status quo. And by saying that uh, this is a plant that we can no longer use, that we just can't have, I think that we, we're limiting the discussion, the possibility for people. And if there's not a good reason for us to continue to maintain the prohibition of marijuana, then I would like you to consider this bill as your opportunity to, to tr truly, truly change people's lives here in Texas. Uh, because this is your opportunity to vote to make this go away, to make this go away and make Texas a freer place for us all. 
And if we're not actually keeping people safer with legislation, with laws, then I think that, as Ann Lee said earlier, they're bad laws and they should be reformed. And I think that this is the opportunity for every one of you to have the courage to stand with Representative Simpson and be proud and, and be supportive of our Texas patients and especially our veterans and the people who need this medicine most. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, members, are there any questions of our panel? No? Thank you. All right, so our next panel, Catherine Neal. All right. Kim Ogg. Carol Alwyn, Renee O'Neill, and then on deck, just please raise your hand if you're here, Daryl Primo. Fabian Quesada. Zoe Russell. This name I'm going to mispronounce. I'm sure uh, Christopher Shitsuka. Just just raise your hands, here, please. <laughs> Steve Schuler. Steve Schuler. Right. Matt Simpson. All right. So just y'all be ready for the next panel, please. Um, so Catherine, yeah. would you please? Uh, Introduce yourself, tell me who you're here representing, and then what your positions are with respect to the to the bill. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Catherine Neal. I work for and represent the drug policy program at Baker Institute at Rice University. I'd like to thank all of you for the opportunity to speak here today. And I'd like to talk about the effects of decriminalization on teen use rates. Yeah. And I'm speaking for 507. Perfect. Okay, uh, since the 1970s, Washington, D.C., along with 19 other states, including Nebraska, <laughs> Nevada, Ohio, and North Carolina, have already removed uh, jail time for low-end marijuana possession cases. One of the fears that's associated with mar marijuana decriminalization is that it's going to drive up teen use. But we can look to the experiences of other states that have decriminalized to see that this is not the case. Mississippi and Alabama provide a useful comparison because these states share a lot of cultural and demographic characteristics, but in Mississippi, possession of 30 grams of marijuana or less is subject to a fine-only penalty, while it's still an arrestable offense in Alabama. Data from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention finds that in 2013, high school students' current marijuana use, which is defined as use within the last 30 days, was slightly higher in Alabama than it was in Mississippi. So this indicates that Mississippi's de decision to decriminalize has not resulted in greater use among teens and that Alabama's stricter penalties are not providing any benefits in terms of lower use. Both of these states also have uh, rates of use among teens that are lower than the national average. And this suggests that there are c cultural and societal factors that play a greater role in teens' decision whether or not to use marijuana than the law does. Looking to the Northeast, there are several states there, they're not all of them, that have decriminalized marijuana. Maine and Massachusetts are two of these states. Data show that teen use in Maine has declined since the state decriminalized in 1999. And in Massachusetts, teen use rates in 2013 were essentially identical to use rates in 2007, which was the year before that state decriminalized. In contrast, the neighboring state of New Hampshire has not decriminalized marijuana. In 2013, New Hampshire had higher rates of teen use than both Maine and Massachusetts. 
It's also worth mentioning that marijuana use among teens in Texas is higher than it is in several states that have decriminalized. This includes Nebraska, Nevada, and Mississippi. So basically, when we look across the United States and we compare states that have decriminalized to those that have not, and when we look within states and we compare teen use before and after states have chose to decriminalize, we see that removing penalties for marijuana has largely no effect on teen use. And I, I think I'm just about out of time. So, um, but if anyone has any other questions about other effects of decriminalization on teens, then I would be happy to answer them. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Kim Og. Yes, sir. Good evening, gentlemen and ladies. I'm Kim Og. I'm an attorney in private practice. I'm representing myself here today, and I'm here to testify in support of House Bill 507. All right, please proceed. The first duty of government in America and Texas is public safety. Of course, who better than the Texas legislature to understand that state and county governments don't enjoy unlimited resources. As a former chief felony prosecutor in the Harris County DA's office, the first anti-gang task force director of Houston, and a past executive director of Crime Stoppers, criminal defense lawyer and 2014 candidate for Harris County DA, I have been immersed in the criminal justice system for 28 years as a professional. Um, Who's being prosecuted for possession of marijuana? I'm going to shorten this. In short, about 80% of those arrested are male, minority, under 25, and poor. That's Harris County. That may not be the state, but that's Harris County. And that's according to statistics and data that we receive from the public defender and through the court administrative offices. What is the cost to taxpayers for misdemeanor prosecution of possession of marijuana? Um, excluding the actual cost of arrest, we know that takes two to three hours of a policeman's time and takes them off their beat in the neighborhood. Uh, Excluding that cost, the cost of jailing 12,629 offenders in the Harris County Jail uh, in 2013 on an average of five days at $70 per day, according to the sheriff, is $4,420,150. The actual cost of the court staff and prosecutor's time for such cases is an additional $6,314,500 for a total expense of $10,734,650. In the last seven years, a review of the statistics of cases filed misdemeanor marijuana in Harris County shows that in the last seven years leading up to 2013, 100,000 people were prosecuted for marijuana under four ounces, 95% of those being prosecuted for marijuana possession under two ounces. The cost of that at 10 million plus per year is $100 million. Meanwhile, our police chief reported when 20,000 felonies were found to have been uninvestigated in the city of Houston, he reported that they just don't have enough resources to adequately prosecute all the cases that are reported. Which leads me to show you what we found about who reports what. In Harris County, Average citizens, like in your counties, I feel certain report crimes like theft, burglary, auto theft, rape, of course other crimes as well, but these are particular crimes that are categorized by the FBI. And we see that in Houston, for example, in 2013, over 40,000 thefts and over 20,000, I'm sorry, 40,000 uh, thefts and 120,000 120,000 thefts, 40,000 burglaries, and we're prosecuting at a level of under 10,000 cases. So the clearance rates are low on the serious crimes and the prosecution rates are even lower. The district attorney's office in Harris County spent 11.75% of their $59 million budget in 2013 prosecuting marijuana under two ounces, Ms. while Hall. using less than 1% to prosecute felony rape and 2% to prosecute burglaries. All right, thank you. We'll, we'll follow up with questions. Certainly. Um, Carol Alwyn. 
My name is Carol Olawan, and I am testifying as a member of and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Texas in support of House Bill 507, and I have written testimony. Thank you so much. The League of Women Voters of Texas supports House Bill 507 to waive or reduce the civil penalties for certain amounts of marijuana. The Texas League considers possession and use of marijuana a public health issue. Education and treatment programs for possession and use of marijuana are supported by the League of Women Voters as an alternative to civil and criminal penalties. We urge you to vote for House Bill 507. Thank you so much. Is it Renee? Yes. All right. <clears throat> Introduce yourself, sir. Please. My name is Renee O'Neill, and I am testifying on behalf of myself, and I'd like to thank Reason and Good Sense for uh, House Bills 507 and uh, also uh, uh, Representative Simpson's uh, Bill HB 2165 uh, for it. All right, so let me just make sure that we have you. Yes, we do. So... Uh, yes, we show you as such. So please proceed, sir. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for giving me the time to speak this evening. Uh, it's late. There's almost nothing I can say that wouldn't be redundant regarding, you know, my own personal plight with my disabilities. There's nothing that uh, that I could say that could be any more powerful than what we've already heard for, from other testimony. What I would like to point out is, additionally, that I don't like to be a criminal. I, I personally do use marijuana and I have combat injuries that, that don't go away and I need my help. Well, I don't like being put into a position where I have to get my marijuana by illegal means. I, I get put into some nefarious situations sometimes. You know, you never know who you're dealing with on the street. And I would like to be able to just walk into a store somewhere and, and buy it like any other thing. You know, because the situation for me is not going to change. I'm not going to start stop buying it. So I, I would prefer that, you know, 2165 actually gets your due diligence and consideration. I mean, that is a very humanitarian law as opposed to the draconians, the draconian laws that I believe we're, we're experiencing now. Uh, I really don't like being branded a criminal and I don't like being put in those situations. And I believe that a lot of violence w would go away if you know faulty drug deals didn't happen if people weren't forced into these you know dark situations uh, i feel like we could really cut down on on a lot of expenditure you know medically with law enforcement i mean this legislature has the chance right now to make history by facing what some people would consider you know the the right thing to do and you know they say that it's easy to do the right thing and sometimes you know you have to face a hard right versus an easy wrong but this isn't that situation we have a chance right now to do the right thing for everybody and there's no reason why we shouldn't and i'm appealing to your better natures to to make it so you guys have a real chance and i, I really thank you for your time i hope that you support that and i i gotta say i support hb 507 as a half step you know, I, I really want you guys to look at 2165 because that is, that, that's the way things should be. That seems to uh, fall in line with the natural order of things for everybody. But 507, if you guys can't find it in yourselves to be champions, if you guys can't find it in yourselves to actually go the whole distance and do the right thing, then at least do half of the right thing and support 507. And at least let's, you know, help people where we can within reason. And, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Uh, <coughs> Ms. Og, is there something else that you wish us to know uh, that you were not able to get within the, the three minutes? If, if you would be succinct and to the point, please. I would. I'd like you to know that everybody in this room thanks you each for your efforts. Just tell me who you are again, and I'm sorry, just for the record. Sorry. sorry. Yeah. Sure. Representative Kim Og, attorney from Houston in private practice representing myself. Good. I'd like to thank Joe Moody. Harold Dutton, David Simpson, each of you who have put up a bill that in, uh, shares common sense. 
uh, I have been on the side of law and order all my career. Marijuana laws, as they are being implemented, do not make the public safer. Burglaries, robberies, murders, those are the cases going uninvestigated, at least in our county, I think, because there's been so much, uh, so many resources devoted to the prosecution of small amounts of marijuana. And so we are not making our city or our counties or our states safer with the current laws. You have the opportunity to do that. And by allowing for a civil penalty, uh, as uh, Representative Moody's bill does, we eliminate 100,000 criminal records for ordinary citizens who then would be freer to remain or join the labor force, obtain housing and education. Thank you so much. Right, Representative Canales. Um, you have a bunch of great information. I'd like to ask you uh, an offline. I know that tonight's been a long night for most of us, but last session we discussed uh, Harold's bill. I supported it then. I support it now. Uh, but I will tell you that um, one of the things that was very interesting to me last session was we had people from probation come. And when you have those staggering statistics of how many misdemeanors are prosecuted and what it came down to, if I remember correctly, and I'd like you to correct me if I'm wrong or give me the information if you can find it offline, is that my understanding was that without misdemeanor possession of marijuana, the probation system would almost collapse because that's how they fund most of there that many probationers are on probation for misdemeanor marijuana. And that's my understanding from last session, but that's a question that I've got for you that I'd like for you to please answer offline if you could. I can't answer it today, but I can answer it in the future and Thank I you. will. Thank you. Thank you all. Any other questions, members? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Daryl Primo. We'll show as uh, for House Bill 2165, representing self, but not testifying. Fabian Quesada. Zoe Russell. Christopher, there you go. Thank you. Um, let me see. So right, we got Matt. Also, okay. Steve Schuler, Steve Schuler, we're gonna show Steve Schuler representing himself, wishing to testify uh, in support, or better yet, in support of HB 507 and HB 2165, but not testifying. So the next group, just raise your hand if you're here. Jamie Spencer, Chuck Taylor, Chuck Taylor, <coughs> William Travis, Hunter White, Hunter White, Nishi Wheatley, Whiteley. All right. Okay, so is there anyone else so far, uh, other than those I've already mentioned, that would like to register for, on, or against the bills that we have before the committee currently? I would encourage you, if you wish to do so, that we need you to register and um, Jamie's up here where you can do that uh, and then we'll add you to the list let me see okay so let me get back to the current panel Fabian would you please uh, introduce yourself your name who you're here with or representing and then what your positions are with respect to uh, the bills that we show you here for yes or my name is uh, Fabian Casada I'm here representing myself and I'm testifying for House Bill 507 
Okay, please proceed. Uh, today we've heard a lot about the 70,000 plus Texans that are arrested every year for marijuana possession, uh, but now you have a face. I was arrested January 29th uh, by Tyler Police uh, for a simple marijuana possession. There was no other criminal activity associated with my arrest, and in fact to this day I do not know what motivated the officer to knock on my window that night. Uh, I'm not a typical marijuana user. I'm an honor student. I was former managing editor of a campus newspaper. Um, I have gone on to be editor-in-chief. And now I'm currently the web editor of MyTJCNews.com for Tyler Junior College. I have won numerous journalism awards representing our school. I'm currently a finalist in the First Amendment Awards in Fort Worth. And as soon as I finish my testimony here, I head to San Antonio to the Texas Intercollegiate Press Association, where I will compete. Because of this arrest, I was immediately expelled from school because of their zero tolerance policy against drugs on and off campus. With the help of my professors and my family, I was able to get recommendation letters, I challenged the university's policy, and I won. I continued to do my managing editor duties from home because it took two weeks before I could enter college again. Fortunately for my work ethic, I never fell behind in my classes. But in spite of being reinstated, my financial aid was terminated. My family was able to hire me a lawyer to help me through the legal process, uh, which follows the arrest, a debt I later paid them for. On my court appearance to be arraigned, I was given a UA, which I failed. I spent 10 days in jail, and I kept thinking to myself how horribly unfair this is for Texans to be in jail for simple possession of marijuana. I was in jail with aggravated assault, people who committed aggravated assault, and domestic violence criminals. I did not belong in jail with these violent criminals. I'm a good person. I made a deal with the prosecutor. I was on probation for seven months. I was granted an early release from the court on March 12th for successfully completing 24 hours community service, a drug class, paid my fines, and passed all my UAs I was required to take. All of this while maintaining a 3.5 GPA and my job at CBS 19. I paid thousands of dollars of court costs without financial aid. Again, I had to pay for my tuition out of pocket, rent, my car, and other living expenses. I was very fortunate. I've had help, but it was still hard. This is not how things work out for many of the other 70,000 Texans who are arrested for marijuana possession. Some get kicked out of school for good or lose their financial aid, financial aid at all. People should not go to jail for the possession of small amounts of marijuana. A fine is much more reasonable. Please support House Bill 507 and stop arresting good people like me for the simple possession of marijuana. Thank you. Christopher, again, state your name, who you're with, and uh, what you support. Yes, sir. My name is Chris Chickadans. I'm a veteran of the United States Army. I'm here on behalf of myself and to support House Bill 2165 and 507. I served as an infantryman in the 2nd Infantry Division 3rd Striker Brigade from 2006 in September to till, um, February 2011, including two deployments to Iraq. During my deployments, I sustained both physical and psychological injuries that were determined to be combat-related by the VA. I'm 40% disabled, 10 for chronic shoulder pain, and 30% for PTSD. I, like most soldiers who finally admit to the symptoms of PTSD they are experiencing, was advised by my doctors to begin pharma pharmacological treatments. Um, after expressing my concerns with the, uh, with the often dangerous and in some cases deadly side effects of these pharmaceutical drugs, I settled on bupropion to help with my anger, depression, anxiety, and prazosine to help deal with my nightmares. Um, I stayed away off the opiates because I had too many friends that have OD'd um, off opiates, so I tried to stay away from those. Um, after getting out of the military with an honorable discharge, I began the process of transitioning back to civilian life. My transition veterans did not go smoothly. Um, on top of taking my medication, I was dangerously addicted to alcohol, and I had a hard time connecting with anyone. This is a little bit difficult for me to read, so apologize if I get emotional. Um, I had gained about 160 pounds in just under a year, um, and it was when I reached my highest weight of 385 pounds in the winter of 2011 that I started having regular suicidal thoughts. Um, this scared me because while I thought that suicide would be a valid option for me, um, I felt it would be a disservice to the many men that I knew who died in Iraq who didn't have the chance to live a life. 
After coming to this realization, I began to research alternative ways of treating my PTSD. Um, during this search for help was when I came across medical marijuana. I was more than a little nervous when I first tried cannabis at the first time at the age of 25. Um, I was raised in the DARE administration days, days and ignorantly believed cannabis to be a dangerous drug that was not to be taken for any reason. Um, what I found was the opposite of danger. I found peace. Um, cannabis immediately helped me to feel normal again. It helped me to once again connect with my friends and my family, and it took away the small steady pain in my shoulder that I feel all the time. It allowed me to muster up enough positive thoughts about myself so that I was able to work, uh, do the work it took to lose the weight, about 140 pounds so far. Um, the only problem with this happy ending is that because I medicate with cannabis, I'm a criminal worthy of being locked in a cage in the eyes of our great state, a state that I signed up and pledged my life to protect. Okay, Lucky for me, I was just wounded while fighting for our country. Um, my, my injury is a price that I would gladly pay again and again um, to, for the freedom to be an American Okay, are treatable with cannabis. Medical cannabis is currently available with the patients re, uh, for patients with a doctor's referral in 23 states. Why do I have to be threatened with jail time and treated as a criminal when veterans in 23 states can medicate with full protection of the law? As a Texas veteran, am I a lesser citizen? Have I not earned the right paid for my, by, by my blood, my sweat, and my tears? to medicate and treat my injuries in a safe way of my choosing. Marijuana is not something that lazy stoners use to marish on those, I'm sorry, excuse me, it's been late, late night. Mar marijuana is not something that just lazy stoners use to marish marathon shows on Netflix while tackling a $20 order from Jack in the Box. <laughs> marijuana is a safe and effective treatment for a number of ailments, and as a good citizen of the state of Texas, I ask our veterans' needs be taken seriously. It is estimated that over 22 veterans commit suicide each day, and I was surely on my way to being counted in that statistic. Thank God that I had the will and the courage to investigate and educate myself on the scientifically proven beneficial properties of marijuana before flippantly writing off the users of this plant medicine as unmotivated potheads deserving incarceration. If not for cannabis, I would not be speaking to you today. That's just a fact. And I ask the state of Texas allow me and others with medical needs like mine to legally and safely access this medication so they're not forced to abandon our homes and become medical refugees in another state. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and thank you for your service. Uh, so go ahead, Matt. Sure. Uh, Matt Simpson uh, from the ACLU of Texas in support of HB 507 and HB 2165. Okay, hold on, Matt. Let me make sure we have you on the other. Oh, sure. Right. Are you going to testify in? If I can, yeah. Yeah, so we'll show you testifying also for HB 2165. Great. In addition to 507. Great. Right. So, in, so support, in support of HB 507. In support of HB 507 and, and HB 2165. Perfect. Go ahead. So uh, I just wanted to quickly talk about uh, the impact criminal records, um, the, the, the way that a person's life can be changed by having a criminal history. Um, both both the bills that, that we're talking about today would, would have a huge impact on low-level uh, drug offenders that are currently having kind of the stain on their record. Um, I think probably everybody in this building at this point realizes that um, with uh, different data data miners and, and different websites, the, the ability to research someone's criminal history is uh, more and more available to just about anybody, uh, employers and everybody else. It's becoming more and more important to think about the impact of criminal records. Um, the Wall Street Journal did a little bit of a, a kind of a, I guess, a it's getting late. They did an infographic. <laughs> and um, for somebody that's 25, if you haven't been arrested, median income is $25,000 a year. If you've been arrested but not convicted, it's 23000 And if you were convicted, the median income is $20,000. So if you're arrested or convicted before the age of 23, you become kind of a less, um, you're, able, you're less able to make money kind of dem demonstrably within the economy. Even more shocking, um, those that are not arrested are 89% graduates from high school. Uh, only 67% of those that are arrested but not convicted graduate, and only 53 of those that are convicted of any crime graduate from high school. So we're talking about something that nationally we can see the trends. Uh, just quickly, I wanted to talk about the kinds of, the kinds of um, life 
problems that can be created. I mean, first, obviously, having a criminal record can create challenges for employment. And let's remember that anybody that's 17 or older in Texas is treated as an adult. So if someone were to get a drug possession charge, you know, this employment could be an issue from 17 on. Uh, second, housing. Um, you know, just an arrest alone, even if it turns out that you aren't convicted, can be a major barrier to housing, and it happens particularly in urban areas. Um, the military, it can be difficult to join the military. Um, you know, we celebrate the service of those that are here that have served, but um, we may be keeping people out that would also like to serve. Uh, bank loans can be difficult to get, which is one that I had never actually thought of until I started looking into this, that um, banks have the access to these databases as well as everyone else. And then finally, college, and, and colleges can sometimes turn down folks. So uh, this is, there's a, a broad array of problems that can be created, um, you know, doing something um, different, uh, and making sure that we don't create criminal records for our young people uh, and helps them succeed. And I think that we're all here to look for ways to help all Texans succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Let's see Zoe. I have, I have a document. I don't know if I can just wait yeah. on that. Just have the graphs on it. That I yeah, but in the meantime, if okay. you mind, just my name is Zoe Russell, and I'm representing Republicans against marijuana prohibition and testifying in favor of HB 507. All right. Um, so, I believe that the goals of our marijuana laws are because society wants to hinder the use of marijuana. It may cause development, brain developmental issues in young people, and it may lead to increased narcotic use, which Dr. Martin refuted somewhat. Um, but if we, we need to look at the policy, if it works or not, regardless what we believe, the penal code, the minor change in the penal code is signaling to young people. We have to see if Texas is gaining anything from bearing all these costs, human costs and law enforcement costs. And like Dr. O'Neill talked about, we can look to the states that changed their laws in the 1970s and states that have changed their laws more recently. And and I have some graphs um, in, in my document for y'all. Um, so you can compare the first graph shows uh, average states that have criminal penalties versus civil penalties and uh, that's ever used marijuana or have used marijuana in the past month based on the survey. And you can see that the differences are negligible and I threw Texas in there so y'all can see as well. Um, again, I have another graph on the next page that shows the state that's have changed their laws more recently. You can see that there was no amazing spike in the next two graphs of teen youth use rates in marijuana because they changed their laws, and I match those to the years. You can, you can judge that by yourself. Um, are marijuana users leading to greater property crimes? If you look at the next graph, dating back to the 70s when these, uh, when these states enacted their civil penalties versus criminal penalties, no. Crime trends are pretty standard nationally, regardless of this minor marijuana change. And again, I pulled out data from the states that have changed more recently and broke them out. And you can see there is no huge increase in crime due to a civil penalty for marijuana. Um, and again, these are civil penalties, so I support HB 507 because we're getting rid of all the collateral consequences. Um, I think the law enforcement communities in Travis County, Dallas County, and Harris County that have instituted policies where they don't arrest people for low-level marijuana offenses have shown that law enforcement recognizes the marijuana offender as the low priority of law enforcement. They are the law enforcement are the ones that led those policies. Um, so if we're not gaining anything, if our, if our numbers match the other states that have civil penalties, what are we costing Texas? Well, quite a lot, over 70,000 arrests. 97.9% um, of all marijuana arrests, including distribution, are for possession. So our goal is to arrest the possessors. That's the Texas strategy. Um, based on my estimates, I heard in the first day of testimony here in criminal jurisprudence that 95% of the statewide possession uh, misdemeanors are class B, so under two ounces, and I think we can estimate that a large number of those are under one ounce because most of these people are caught with a joint. Um, so about half of 45 percent of the of people arrested in the state are 21 and under. 75 percent are 29 and under. So yes, this is a young person thing. If we change this law, if we accepted HB 507 based on my numbers, and I can provide those to you, it would impact about four and a half to six percent of all arrests in Texas. And if you can show me another criminal justice issue that can save us that much money and not affect public safety, I'd love to see it. Um, I have, y'all can just look at my data from here. It's basically just the human costs are insane. I went to school for economics and putting somebody, uh, giving them a criminal record and ensuring that they never reach their full potential is bad for the economy. Um, we can 
to look at Bill Clinton, George Bush, Barack Obama. They've all done it, but they didn't caught, get caught. Jeb Bush, Ted Cruz, they've admitted to doing it, but didn't get caught. <coughs> it's an unfair policy, and it's bad for Texas, bad for our economy. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions, members of our panel? No, thank you all. Appreciate it. So if I would, uh, I'm going to ask Jamie Spencer to come forward. Yes, sir. Chuck Taylor. Chuck Taylor, why? Chuck Taylor. Let me be shown for House Bill 2165. <clears throat> Representing himself, not testifying. William Travis. Here, sir. All right. Hunter White. Hunter White. All right. All right. We're going to show Hunter White representing Republicans against marijuana prohibition for House Bill. Eight, I'm sorry, yes, House Bill 507 did not testify. Nishi Wheatley. She's gone. Going to be shown representing herself in support of HB 507 but did not testify. Michael Barefoot. Michael Barefoot going to be shown representing himself for House Bill 2165 but did not testify. Jacqueline Finkel. Just left. Destiny Young. Here we go. Anyone else that's going to wish to testify for or honor against the bills that we have um, before our committee? Yeah, I'm going to need you all to come uh, and register. So, let me see, we're back to is it Jamie Spencer. All right. Mr. Spencer, if you would please uh, give us your full name, who you are here representing, and then what your positions are with respect to those bills that you've uh, registered. My name, my name is Jamie Spencer. I'm with Texas Normal. I'm also here on behalf of myself and testifying in both capacities in support of House Bill 507. All right. Please proceed, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, thank you for holding this hearing. I'm here to testify against my own financial interest. I am a criminal defense lawyer. I make money, at least in part, because possession of less than one ounce of marijuana is a crime. In 18 years of practice, I've represented hundreds and hundreds of citizens charged with possession of marijuana. And from my personal experience, uh, I agree with what we hear about probably it being 90 to 95 percent is less than one ounce. As you know, the Class B is less than two, so uh, that could be a little difficult to determine specifically. Um, I think there have probably been years, literally years, where every single possession of marijuana client I had was charged with possession of less than one ounce. Ounce. And I can tell you again from personal and professional experience being in the courthouse almost every day that these cases are clogging the county court system in Texas. Monday through Friday in 254 counties across Texas, judges and prosecutors are taking time away from working on important misdemeanors such as DWI and assault family violence because lawyers like me come and pester them with these minor offenses. And in my experience, both the judges and the prosecutors would really appreciate it if they could focus on what is important and not this minor offense. Um, this legislation is very timely. 
Uh, now is the time for it. Uh, I, I am going to be brief. I want to end by saying that when one of the last reasons for maintaining the status quo is to line the pockets of criminal defense lawyers, I hope we can all agree it's time for a change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. Let me see, Mr. Travis. Yes, sir. My name is Will Travis. I'm the sheriff in Denton County. Uh, I'm representing myself. I'm also rep representing the uh, Sheriff's Association of Texas. I'm here uh, against uh, House Bill 325, House Bill 414, uh, House Bill uh, 507, and last but not least, House Bill 2165. Right, very good, sir. Please proceed. On House Bill 325, we uh, we, we do this. Uh, this is not something that's uh, you know that the defense attorney is talking about. We we do this every day. We defer these these cases. I think our district attorneys do a great job of it. I don't think it clogs up the system. Our jails are not loaded with these people like have been everybody's been talking about tonight. I have one, and every 250 in my jail, I have a 1,400 bed jail, and they're in for large amounts. It's not for for sm small amounts of this stuff. The uh, the other one, uh, House Bill 414, uh, we believe it gives the uh, small drug user multiple opportunities before their uh, conduct has been um, has met their consequences and encourages them to stay in the drug culture uh, world is um, and it just doesn't create a good environment because you're just getting time after time of multiple uh, chances to, to to get it right. But uh, there again, I think our district attorney's office do a great job of what they do of deferring these cases and giving them uh, multiple chances. But, you know, you just don't want to give them the world because they are breaking the law. Uh, House Bill 507 is a civil bill. And, um, you know, where the uh, – yeah, you, you, you – um, who was this, the state representative? It's uh, – you moved it to 250? That's me. To, moved it to 250, sir? The uh, civil penalties is not more than um, two hundred fifty dollars. The state would have a very difficult time collecting this if they default on this and uh, locating a defendant after a after a default judgment uh, would cost the taxpayers a ton of money to, to just off two hundred fifty dollars. And uh, who keeps the evidence in a uh, in a uh, uh, civil case? Um, and then uh, obviously uh, House Bill. Now I get three minutes on. Each or just three minutes. So I'm about done then. All right. Uh, I am very much against 2165. I think it would be a travesty to, uh, to pass this. I think uh, you guys all swore to an oath. Uh, you were all elected because you're honorable positions, and I think you ought to remember that when you don't pass this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Travis. Jacqueline Finkel. My name is Jacqueline Finkel. I am representing myself, and I am speaking in favor of HB 507. I come here to tell you a story about um, a burglary that happened um, to me quite a few years back. We were gone on a family vacation. I returned early without my husband. I came home to find that the house had been burglarized. They had gotten in through a window where there was a cat door they thought they could get in through the cat door. Instead, they broke the window. In an effort to try to hide the fact that they had gotten in through the window, they took a long unused um, screen and put it back over the window. Upon finding that we had been robbed, I immediately called the police, um, hoping that they would come and assist us. I was glad when they showed up and um, very encouraged when they took fingerprints and found thumb fingerprints exactly where the screen was put back on the window. They took those fingerprints, they gave me a number to call to check and see how my case has pro progressed. I called that number every two weeks for nine months. The fingerprints were never run. It was never assigned to a detective. I support HB 507 because I believe that it will have law enforcement on the streets after more violent crimes and after crimes with people that are victims such as myself. You are representatives of the people of Texas. 
and I am one of the 61% of Texans that support HB 507. I hope you remember your duty to represent us. I appreciate you staying here late into the evening to hear each of us. I respect and appreciate each of you that are working towards um, changing cannabis laws in Texas. HB 507 is the right bill. It will put law enforcement back on the streets going after victim crimes instead of going after victimless crimes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Let me let me go to the, the other witness, and, um, and then I'm going to ask. And it's going to sound silly, but I need to do it for the record. But you'll know what I'm talking about in a little bit when I get to it. So, um, Destiny Young. Yeah. Go ahead. My name is Destiny Young. I'm speaking on behalf of myself, and I'm in support of 2165. Um, I'm in support of this bill for something that hasn't actually been brought up yet, and it's the re-education of America. I ran a daycare for two years for infants. People pay me to take care of their babies and their toddlers, and I'm very good. I teach children uh, art and music and sign language, and I love my job. I lost my daycare because I am an activist, not because I smoked weed around children, not because children had access to it, because I am an activist for this. And I believe in children, I've done this for more than 13 years, and seeing sick children is the reason that I started this. Having my daycare taken away from me because I decided to help sick children is the reason I continue to do this. I was told by a licensing agent for the state of Texas that my association with people that may smoke pot outside of business hours somehow endangered children that I care for. Not my use outside of business hours or my decision to use something recreationally that was illegal put them in danger, but my association with people that make their own adult decisions did that. This person is trained by the state. This person most likely had a degree in social work, um, which means they were trained twice in this specific matter. And um, I know specifically those people are trained on that because my sister is a police officer who was first an education major, which she did have training on how to deal with kids in high school that do decide to do drugs. So she had a training on marijuana. She was switched her major to social work, which she was again trained about marijuana on. Then she decided to go into, with her social work degree, a CPS um, vocation as an investigator and then later as a police officer of Carrollton. She wants to become a detective and I would like the further miseducation of my sister to stop. I feel that 2165 would force us to re-educate and properly educate very, very many branches of the government, including licensing and CPS. Those things tear people away from their families and they take children away from very, very capable care providers that also give them <laughs> discounts. So they may be in places that aren't as good as my daycare was um, because I associated with activists. Um, I don't think that the education currently is right. I grew up with the D.A.R.E. program, 31 years old. When D.A.R.E. started, it was, McGruff was like a weekly part of our life. Um, and we were miseducated. I was told if you knew anything about marijuana, you knew people with guns, you knew people that would hurt you, you knew people that were bad. Well, my mom was 31, and she had three young kids all by herself with the same anxiety I have. And I can't imagine being a mom in 1996 and having to use weed with the anxiety that I also have with three young children. So the miseducation should stop. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, members, are there any questions of this panel? No, thank you. Let me hold on, sir, please. Um, here's where I'm going to, it's going to sound silly, but I need to make sure that the Jacqueline Finkel, yes, there, that there's only one Jacqueline Finkel. Uh, so, we, yeah, I, I thought I had already registered, but then it didn't show up on her list. Right. So she had me re register. There's only me. Well, let me, let me, let me, I, I don't, I, I believe you, but I have to just make sure that there's, okay. a, there's some miraculous reason other than Jacqueline Finkel. So let me ask Jacqueline Finkel. Um, any other, yeah, junior? <laughs> uh, otherwise, we're going to show it as a duplicate uh, and that it's you. So thank you for bearing with my, uh, anyway. 
Thank, Thank you. Thank you for you. being with us. So let me, uh, Mr. Travis, uh, is there something else that you wish to share with the committee? Just going to let you know, I just passed each and every one of y'all the latest and greatest out of uh, Colorado, that is the uh, high intensity drug trafficking uh, survey that comes out every year. I made them do it six months early just because I needed it for this hearing. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Any other questions, members? Thank you Thank all. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. All right, so the only other person that I show so far left to testify is Marissa Laufer. Anyone else wishing to come forward to testify for or against the bills that we have uh, pending before the committee at this point? Anyone else wishing to come forward to testify for, on, or against uh, HB 507, HB 2165, HB 325, and HB 414? I need you to register, please. Uh, otherwise, um, let me see. Marissa Laufer? Yes, hi. Hi. Um, um, my name is Marissa Laufer, and I represent myself as well as uh, the San Antonio a national organization for Mar uh, for reform of marijuana laws in San Antonio. I am in support of both, uh, and I am testifying for both uh, House Bill 2165 and House Bill 507. Um, basically, what like what I'd Ms. like to point out is um, Ms. Laufer, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. I, I was doing something else at the time, but so just for the record, and maybe others heard it, but you're here testifying on which bills or for um, which for both. 2165 and 507. Okay, please proceed. Yes. Okay, so we know that it's up to you, the legislators, to uh, vote and, and, and for this to get in front of the governor's desk for it to be signed into law. However, many, uh, many of the, like Colorado and Washington, were able to use a, a citizen's ballot initiative, which I think is the best way because it gets us activated and gets people to sign petitions. But we don't have that. We feel like our hands are tied behind our backs. It's, you know, it's, if you pass this out of committee, you're allowing the tech, you allow Texas, Texans to voice their opinion through their legislators. So it, I mean, this issue and debate really needs to be beyond these, these walls and into a larger arena. And so that's, I really hope that you understand that we need to, we need to go to the next step, to the next level. Uh, and that's for both of 2165 and 507. Um, and we know that if 2165 and 507 do not pass this session, that people who suffer from uh, deadly and debilitating conditions are going to have to wait till 2017 to work on changing the laws. I don't think people have, uh, you know, they've had to wait uh, ever since you've been working on 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 legislation. So I think. I think just the way that Texas legislation works, it really halts progress, and 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 I think we need to just get on board uh, the progress train or whatever. Um, we know that marijuana does not live; uh, it does not exist in a vacuum. It does connect to uh, all walks of life. However, it, it affects people of color disproportionately. Uh, the majority of people in, in prisons are poor people and people of color. Uh, we've seen um, lo a lot of, of, of reports of police brutality and people dying, and I, I really think there, there's a connection with more money towards public safety, more money to enforce these drug laws, and more deaths uh, because police are being trained to shoot, uh, you know, to be the judge, jury, and executioner, as opposed to just doing their job and, you know, arresting and let you know these laws could actually change change communities and i also represent uh activists who want to raise awareness about uh the students uh the ayatsanapa 43 
students in Mexico, uh, they represent thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people that are killed because of drug cartel violence. Uh, you know, the drug war is an international issue. Uh, we send, we send, we send weapons. We send money to Mexico, but really, it's it's our it's it's our habit, and we need to take responsibility for our habits, and that's what we're trying to do. To me, it is it is blood marijuana. Uh, we could grow uh, healthy, um, you know, something that does not kill innocent people in Mexico, and I'm really passionate about raising awareness about that. And I'm also passionate about the fact that, you know, Honduras and El Salvador, uh, people are, are, are migrating. They're forced to migrate to get away from the violence. It's all connected to uh, illegal drug trade. And if we, you know, we bring this out and work on it in, in the United States, I think we're going to be solving a lot of problems. Thank you. Right, thank you. Any questions? No. no. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to come forward to testify for, on, or against House Bill 507, House Bill 2165, House Bill 325, or House Bill 414, or wishing to register for, on, or against House Bill 507, House Bill 2165, House Bill 325, or House Bill 414? Chair, hearing none, at this time we will close the witness registrations for House Bill 507, House Bill 2165, House Bill 325, and House Bill 414. And so at this time, the chair will recognize Representative Simpson to close on House Bill 2165. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. David. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for hearing this bill, and I'd also like to thank uh, Representative Dutton for his uh, faithfulness on this issue. And anyway, I, I think we've made a lot of headway this evening, replacing fear with facts and, and the testimony that's been given. And uh, we can't fix all the past wrongs with the prohibition, but we can stop perpetuating him. With that, I close. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Simpson. At this time, the chair will withdraw the committee substitute to House Bill 2165 and leave House Bill 2165 pending. Chair will now recognize Representative Moody to close on House Bill 325 on behalf of Representative Wu. Um, <clears throat> thank you, members. On behalf of Representative Wu, I will close on the measure. Chair will now uh, leave House Bill 325 pending. Chair will now recognize Representative Moody to close on House Bill 507. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I want to refer back to um, Representative Wu's comments when he laid out his bill. I mean, he described what he saw as a prosecutor, and I was a prosecutor on the opposite end of the state, and I saw literally the same thing. Uh, what he described is, it's pretty crazy, it's alarming that we do things that way, and it should be a wake-up call for our state. And we have to move away from the criminal realm altogether on these types of offenses to achieve uh, some of these goals that we have. Simply trading one criminal penalty for another doesn't change whether someone is arrested Police already have the options of issuing citations, even for Class B marijuana cases, and most departments have not done that. There's an institutional resistance to change, and that means Class C offenders can and will be put in cuffs and go to jail for marijuana. In fact, there's an incentive to arrest to facilitate a search. Mr. Levin's testimony confirmed that when we went through those facts. Class C doesn't change any of the collateral consequences, such as obstacles to school, jobs, housing, driving, even residents in this country. It just takes away the attorneys who would otherwise warn people of these consequences. And the whole idea of deferred leading to expunction is a myth. Many will pay the fine as if they were a ticket, not understanding the consequences, which means it can never, ever be expunged or sealed. Even those that complete deferred adjudication will then have to hire an attorney. The going rate at that, uh, for that is roughly around $1,000 to handle that expunction in district court. 
And so if we've got folks that can't afford the system now, I don't think we're doing any better under a measure like that. Um, we didn't hear one single person. Actually, you know what? I'm going to take that back. I want. I don't like to be in the position to disagree with anyone named William Travis um, as a Texan, as a proud Texan, but um, I do want to clarify a couple of things that the sheriff brought up in his testimony. Um, he had a couple of technical concerns. I think he was the only one that raised them in testimony with the way the bill functions. Uh, in the substitute, we adopted almost wholly what, how justice courts operate in criminal cases under Chapter 45 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. Um, specifically, he was wondering how we're going to get these people to appear and how we're going to make to make a payment, what enforcement mechanism we have. Page 3, lines 15 through 17 of the substitute uh, authorized the justice court to offer uh, to um, issue capious, uh, capious in instances of failing to appear or failure to make payment. That's exactly what we do with traffic tickets and justice courts today. So to say that we won't be able to do that with this structure is not correct. So, and the other part was what he, he asked about what we do with the marijuana that's confiscated in civil cases. Uh, if you go to page three, lines 18 through 25 of the committee substitute, um, that deals with, that lays out exactly how you would confiscate, store, and destroy the evidence in civil sanctions under this bill. So I invite him to take a look at those. And it was a substitute that came out today. Some of these weren't, some of these changes weren't in there. So hopefully that's alleviated the technical concerns. Um, I didn't hear any other witnesses testify to the technical concerns about how uh, this bill would move forward. Um, the substitute I worked, uh, I worked on uh, was meant to address a lot of the concerns that we had heard on the structural and functional elements of the bill. We've been working on this for over a year now. Um, if philosophically at the end of the day you don't think we should move to a civil sanctioning regime, that's where we're going to have to depart ways. And that's fine. And we can have that discussion. What I'm interested in is there's anyone out there that has a functional structural change to the civil sanctioning regime that we've built into the committee substitute to House Bill 507, please contact me. Let's talk about it. I think we've done a good job of creating a structure that will work in the way that the Texas law exists today, and it doesn't create a new structure that has to be built up at taxpayer expense. So if you have those, uh, if you have those concerns, please bring them to me as soon as you can. Um, I want to thank all the witnesses that were here. All, all of them spend so much time with us um, that you know I know what it's like traveling to and from the capital from long distances. So I appreciate that. And waiting here long hours is something that I, I sincerely appreciate. I know I know the other representatives do. I also want to thank the members of the committee. It's late, and y'all have given this issue, which is important, a lot of attention, a lot of focus, and, and I appreciate that um, as a colleague. Um, I want to thank one witness who's not here, and that's Colt DeMorris who's from El Paso, he's the first, he's a constituent I sat down with over a year ago, and he said, hey, I got an idea for you. And um, uh, <laughs> from, that, from that conversation, uh, we started working with other organizations around the state and around the country to, to craft something that works. And so hopefully that's what we've done here. Um, hopefully we struck a balance, and I look forward to passing this bill out of the committee. Thank you, members. I close. All right. Uh, any questions, members? No. At uh, this time, the chair will draw, withdraw the committee substitute to House Bill 507 and leave House Bill 507 pending. Now the chair will recognize Chairman Dutton to close on House Bill 414. Um, and just briefly mention the reason I, I've, I've asked you to speak last, because uh, as was heard through testimony, I think you of, of all people here uh, have been working on this issue longer than anyone else. So well, know, uh, I'll give you the floor, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, 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 I think that's a compliment. <laughs> 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 uh, but I, um, I do want to thank uh, all of the witnesses, uh, many of them. Some of them I've known since uh, 2003 when we started this journey, uh, like Ms. Lee and a lot of others out there. Um, since 2003, there have been 26 changes in marijuana laws in 21 states. Um, actually, uh, the bill that I have, uh, we passed it twice out of this committee. Uh, it passed out of this committee. It's never gotten to the House floor. But it has passed this committee, and, and I'm looking forward to doing that again. I, I, I looked at, um, I want to thank my colleagues, too, uh, particularly David Simpson and uh, Mr. Moody and uh, Mr. Wu for um, for making sure this thing stays on the radar screen because, uh, you know, if we don't pass it this time, 
you know, we'll have 12 legislators down here next time. <laughs> and, uh, and it'll just get bigger, and then it'll just get bigger. And then at some point, like when I started, I said that someday we're going to do this. And I believe that that day has come where uh, Texas and this committee is a lot smarter than we were in 2003 even. Um, I do like some things in some of the other bills that I've seen. Um, if, if I were, if I were um, you know, had my way, I think I'd probably want to do David Simpson's bill myself, uh, if I had my way. But, but, but again, I have to always come back to the reality that I'm in Texas. <laughs> and so I have to recognize that um, you know, everything around here is political, which means can you get 76 votes in the House for it? Um, and so trying to figure out what we can get 76 votes for in the House has is, is always been difficult. But I think, um, and I looked at Mr. Moody's um, parts of his, uh, that we, we would intend to add to this one, which would make this all civil as opposed to criminal, that we forgot that part of it. Uh, and I think, it, I think this, um, this measure deserves a vote out of this committee. And I think it certainly ought to get to the calendars committee. And I see the chairman of calendars here. And I know we can count on his support in calendars. <laughs> so uh, with, that, with that, Mr. Chairman and members, thank you all. And I close and thank you for the opportunity to present this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, the chair will withdraw the committee substitute to House Bill 414 and will leave House Bill 414 pending. Before we uh, move on to the last set of bills, uh, we're going to bring up uh, pending business members. But this time, the chair will lay out House Bill Eight. I'm sorry, Eight Six One by Representative Dell as pending business. This is the bill that relates to the prosecution of the offense of online solicitation of a minor. The chair offers a committee substitute to House Bill Eight. 61 is there any objection to the adoption of the committee substitute to house bill 861 chair hearing none committee substitute for house bill 861 is adopted representative canales moves that house bill 861 as substituted be reported favorably to the full house with the recommendation that it do pass and be printed and sent to the general calendar with the clerk please call the roll chairman editor Aye. Vice Chair Moody? Aye. Representative Canales? Aye. Representative Hunter? Yes. Representative Leach? Yes. Representative Shaheen? Aye. Representative Simpson? Aye. There being seven ayes, zero nays, zero present not voting, zero absences. House Bill 861 as substituted prevails. Chair now lays out House Bill 989 by Representative Frulo as pending business. House Bill 898 relates to defenses and exceptions. I'm sorry, 989. We're on House Bill 989 by Representative Frulo. This is pending business. House Bill 989 relates to defenses and exceptions to the prosecution of the criminal offense of the possession, manufacture, transport, repair or sell of certain prohibited prohibited explosive